Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, uh, gathering of some very uh, highly regarded and highly esteemed deans in management education. We're here today to um, talk about the new accreditation standards that have been uh, just uh, passed unanimously uh, by AACSB International Membership. And we'll have a question and answer session around this. Um, my name is Tim Westerbeck. I'm the president of Eduvanus. And I'd like to begin by introducing our, our panel. To my immediate left is uh, Do Joe D'Angelo, uh, Dean of the Evan H. Hobbs School of Business at St. Joseph's University. Uh, Thierry Grange, President, uh, General Grenoble Ecole de Management in France. Uh, Sunil Kumar, uh, Dean of the Chicago Booth School of Business. Uh, Linda Livingstone, Dean of the Graziadio uh, School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University. Uh, Ray Whittington, Dean of the Dry House College of Business at the Kelstat Graduate School of Business at DePaul University. And Jan Williams, Dean of the College of Business Administration, uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, the, uh, we have 30 minutes here today, so I encourage everyone to um, give succinct answers. And the only rule is to not uh, talk at the same time. Uh, we'll have uh, several reporters who have logged into this conference as well who will be uh, offering questions which will be fed up here as we go, which we will introduce into the group. So given that we only have 30 minutes, um, let's get started. Um, I'd like to open it with a question uh, to the group, and anyone can start on this, is these new standards, which were uh, the result of really several years of substantial work to identify uh, new standards that will help govern uh, the quality assurance processes in higher education and in business schools through AACSB. What signal do these new standards send to consumers of management education in terms of the way they've been designed, the way they're going to be implemented? Um, would you like to start uh, today, Joe? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, we hope that it sends the signal that uh, AACSB is practicing what it preaches in terms of continuous improvement. Um, we're constantly trying to make sure that our standards are relevant uh, and uh, to the to the members, not only here in the United States but uh, but around the world. I think one of the things that uh, we are hoping that that our customers uh, understand is that this whole process was designed to maintain uh, academic quality, uh, but also be attentive uh, to the changes in the academic environment and to the new modes of academic delivery. Mm -hmm. Others like to comment on this? What, what uh, signal do these new standards send to consumers of management education, employers, prospective students? Jen? Well, I think one of the important points is that all schools are not just alike, uh, that we, you know, it's a, a strong continued commitment to mission-based accreditation, which allows schools to be distinctively different from each other while still meeting a set of high-quality standards. Would add we have kind of three overarching themes with the standards that I think send a very strong message about what we think is important for business schools kind of in the context of their mission and and where they happen to be located and so the the theme throughout is that we want to encourage innovation uh, across schools around the world that we really want to encourage engagement engagement between students and students students and faculty and then with the business community and that we want student, uh, schools to think about how what they're doing is impacting not just their students but the business community and society more broadly. So innovation, impact, and engagement are really important themes that you see embedded throughout that we think are really important to kind of all stakeholders of the process. There's a very diverse group of schools represented on this panel by design. And uh, Dean Kumar is a, the uh, dean of, a, of a, obviously a very highly regarded global school. Uh, based in the U.S., um, what, what is your particular perspective on, on, on the, the nature of these standards? Uh, as Joe pointed out, um, first of all, the fact that the ASCSP is willing to revisit its standards periodically and adapt them for the changing world of uh, business education is a very positive sign. The second is this notion of a standard is not intended to enshrine the past but rather facilitate and evaluate all possible models in the future is a very good thing. Mm -hmm. And the third, as a dean of a global school, uh, and which has several, you know, almost half a dozen MBA programs, which are very different from each other, 
uh, the idea that there isn't a single standard model that works for a program or an institution is a very good thing. It's a very good thing for society because it provides students with choice so that they can ask the question, what's the right program for me, rather than simply, what's the right program? Mm -hmm. Dean Whittington, would you like to add to this? The, uh, I, I guess I, drawing a little bit on what Jan had said about the uh, flexibility of standards and adapting to various types of edu educational institutions, I think one of the other important things is the emphasis on teaching, which uh, while it was implicit in the uh, original, the, the prior standards, it's now very explicit about the, the interaction between scholarship and teaching and the, and the fact that scholarship is designed to basically enforce the teaching within the institution. So I think that that's going to be a, a very good uh, benchmark to, to push forward in, as we go through the accreditation of, of schools through these new standards. Mm -hmm. Terry, would you like to offer the uh, European perspective? Please? Yes, uh, very, very briefly. I think that uh, uh, these new standards uh, show that ACSB is able to uh, go on the line of this great movement that uh, everywhere in the world is uh, changing radically the industry of business education. And uh, ACSB shows uh, via this uh, process of uh, creating new standards that are uh, more relevant to the reality of the world that uh, uh, all the uh, gold questions that uh, were existing 10 years ago, like uh, American-centric point of view for uh, accreditation or uh, one shoes fits uh, all for in terms of business school, this does no more exist. And now the process of accreditation is as global as the institution is and as the membership is today more than uh, almost 50 percent of the members are uh, coming out of the United States. Very good. Um, now the standards, the new standards clearly emphasize flexibility. It's been a theme of some of the things that you're saying here. Does flexibility mean it will necessarily be easier to get accredited? Could you talk a bit about sort of <coughs> the, the role of flexibility uh, in these standards? Well, it's probably not uh, mainly a question of flexibility or of ease. It's a question of relevance to the situation of business schools uh, worldwide. Uh, fortunately, I would say <laughs> there is a great diversity worldwide in terms of looking at business education, looking at the organization of business schools, and therefore uh, a set of uh, standards, a set of uh, guidelines, or a set of principles, because maybe the there are not only standards in the uh, ACSB process, should be able to uh, comply or to look at the reality of this word. And so it is not that much flexible. It is taking account how the members are worldwide and taking account how they would like to be in the near future. ACSB is not looking only back and saying this is what happened up to now. It is a, a sort of a projection in the next step of uh, the uh, management education that will definitively be completely different of what we know even today. Very good. Um, could uh, Joe, could you spend a minute talking a little bit about this balance between uh, sort of flexibility yet maintaining uh, very high quality standards? Yeah, I, there's this misconception people are equating flexibility with ease. And, uh, and, and uh, I think we need to dispel that. Um, there is no one, as, as some of my colleagues have said, no one way uh, and one, no one model uh, for, for business education. There are a number of different stakeholders. There are a number of different uh, populations. There are a number of different geographic areas. And we're trying to be sure that the education that's being provided is relevant. That's different. Uh, than, than, than easy. Uh, none of, I don't think any of the standards are easy, uh, but what we do is provide options for schools, depending on who, what your mission is, to, to achieve a level of quality. Jan, would you like to add to that point? The, the question um, is the balance of quality and flexibility. Yeah, I guess I would like to take just a little bit different angle on it. Uh, when, when the, the number of standards are reduced as significantly as, as we have with, with these new standards, you know, a simplistic view of that might be that these are easier because there are fewer standards. You know, it's a smaller number. Uh, I think exactly the opposite is true. Uh, by eliminating redundancy in standards, reducing the number, and then focusing even more attention on the most important things, 
Uh, I think actually, if anything, is raising is raising the standards. That doesn't exactly address flexibility, but I think that's an important point to be made. Uh, there is, but I, I agree with Joe that that flexibility doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it's easier. Uh, to meet the standards, it simply means that they are more adaptable in different cultures, uh, different kinds of institutions. But but the standards are, are are actually, in my opinion, higher than the previous standards. I might give just a couple of specific examples where I think that that's the case. So uh, standard two talks about the scholarly work that is happening within uh, an or, uh, within the institution, and in the old standards, it really just asked you to report how many you were doing in different categories. Um, and you certainly wanted to ensure they were quality, but there wasn't really a mechanism for reporting on that. The way the new standard is written, it basically asks a school to speak to how their scholarship is supporting their mission as an organization, uh, how they're assessing quality of that scholarship, and how they're looking at the impact of that scholarship. So those are much higher standards for talking about your scholarly work as an, uh, a school than we had in the old standards. And it's going to require schools to be much more thoughtful and strategic strategic about what they're doing from a scholarship perspective and how they're thinking about that in the context of where they're located and the kind of school that they happen to be. Uh, and I would uh, argue too, Ray talked about the teaching effectiveness standard. Uh, people, you know, we sort of expected that that was happening, but now people really have to speak to how they're ensuring that the quality of the learning experience is uh, excellent within the context of who they are. And so I believe there are specific elements within the new standards that actually raise the bar for schools to help ensure that they are providing overall high quality. Very good. Uh, we have a reporter question I'd like to ask the group to respond to, which is uh, how would AACSB measure whether an institution is in fact being innovative? Tough question. Well, the the, the method is uh, first uh, in the guidelines that are uh, uh, given with the new uh, standards. That is one point. So the schools will be will have a help and will have an assistance to uh, see uh, to, to to write and to uh, describe and document what they are doing. But mainly, uh, the question is to see which alignment uh, does exist between the mission of the school what they really do every day, and what they should do uh, regarding their vision to be uh, relevant in the near future. And uh, I would say that the, 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 the validity of innovation is not uh, the breakthrough or the fact that it is just uh, uh, a little improvement. It is the fact that it is exactly what is needed for this type of school in its uh, regional uh, context, in its uh, stakeholder uh, expectation and that's the good innovation it is the one that will help the institution to improve and not something else coming from a theory uh, let me try something simpler yeah uh, yeah we'll measure it by by seeing which uh, which corporations uh, support it by either providing uh, financial resources or by hiring the students uh, when they line up to hire your students coming out of coming out of your programs because they appreciate kind of education that you're providing, that's a, a measure a measure of excellence. Um, and the proof will be in the pudding. Dean Kumar, how do you measure innovation in a business school? I, I think uh, it's not necessary, as uh, Joe was implying, to measure innovation per se. Yeah. Rather, it's uh, essential to ask the question, is the school delivering on being the school it has chosen to be? And as the w business world changes, uh, and student aspirations change, and the kind of problems the faculty study change, uh, it is essential that the school innovate. Otherwise, it, the outcomes don't look as good as they did, say, a few decades ago. And so I think what the standard does is by holding people responsible for being true to their mission and the choice of school that they have made, uh, it it says you have to innovate because if you don't, you will slip from your mission, rather than explicitly <coughs> saying here are six criteria by which innovation is measured. Dean Whittington, some comments? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it does tie to the outcome, uh, and outcomes uh, in the long run are going to basically measure whether innovation is taking place in the institution, but it's also tied to the continuous improvement objective of the standards, and that's basically looking at how 
uh, universities and colleges are trying to I innovate to to achieve continuous improvement within their within their programs and within their courses. So I think that that's an important part of this process. Also, any other comments on this point? You know, we evaluate schools every five years. Uh, if if, if a peer review team came into a school and every th and there'd been no change. I, I, let me back up. I, I don't know that change necessarily implies innovation, but I think the lack of change probably implies a lack of innovation. So if if we went into a school and there virtually had been no change, I think that would be a, a signal of, of a lack of innovation. But ultimately, we're going to rely on the peer review team mm -hmm. to assess whether innovation is occurring in a school. That's really the foundation of AECSB accreditation, in my opinion, is peer review. And we will expect peer review teams to assess uh, the extent to which schools are being innovative. How do you all feel that these new standards will perhaps help shape the management education industry generally going forward? These are obviously very important standards that uh, a lot of schools use to guide their continuous improvement and their innovation. Uh, what are your thoughts on how these standards will actually help shape the future? I'll say, I think one of the places where we'll see that <clears throat> in these standards, uh, and this is a specific kind of example, but within the context of these standards, we do talk much more broadly about the role of ethics and social responsibility and sustainability, both in terms of how the school manages its own operations, but also in terms of how they're doing that in the context of the learning experience. And there's specific intent in that to really make that an important part of the conversation in business schools and as they engage with the business community. So I think they'll have an impact in that regard. The other thing that you see in the standards, uh, obviously technology-enabled learning, online learning has become a huge, huge issue where there's lots of discussion about how it's being done and the quality. And embedded throughout the standards are discussions about how you apply these standards consistently across those kinds of programs. So I think it will also have a very big impact on how that part of the learning experience evolves over time in a way that tries to ensure high quality across it being done in different ways in different contexts. So I think there's a variety of kind of specific ways it impacts beyond the broader discussion around innovation that we discussed, uh, encouraging that kind of innovation, encouraging different kinds of models for how we think about business education. Any way to come? I think the going back to the flexibility discussion, we could also look at uh, a lot of schools, I think, under the previous standards, probably erroneously were trying to basically believe that they had to meet a certain model to be able to be accredited. And, and that model was kind of, uh, I, if I'm like this school over here, I, I can be accredited because that school's accredited. I think under the new flexible standards, schools will really look at what what really makes sense for me and what what can I do uh, ver with a very high quality in, in my environment, uh, and I think that overall is going to improve the quality of uh, programs going forward. Yeah, let me let me touch on that. Yesterday, I was asked a question by a reporter: the new standards uh, uh, talk about sustainability. How many courses are you going to require in sustainability? That's the exact opposite of what we're looking for. Okay, there is no one model. If we start putting in the number of courses based on every topic, first of all. You, you, you design a program, you design a curriculum based on the portfolio of faculty members you have, and all of their skills are different. So there may be some schools that will put a course or two in in sustainability, but there probably will be more uh, schools that will cover sustainability as it permeates the entire curriculum. So the, it, we're only limited by our creativity. The standards are designed to encourage the creativity. And we're not, we're not looking for a simple checkoff sheet. That's not how these are designed. That's not what we're looking for. Uh, thank you. These, uh, these are, have been fabulous discussion points, uh, and time does fly uh, when you're having a com good conversation. There's, uh, we have four minutes left, and I'd like to leave the group, and maybe we can just go down the row here and offer your perspective. No? I was, how much time do you have? Sorry? Oh, you told me five. I'm sorry. Misunderstood. Well, let me restate that. <laughs> We've just been granted more time, more than, I, more than I'd realized. So um, we'll go to the question anyway. Management education, like most industries, is under a lot of pressure these days. It's no secret that there's been a lot of disruption in the industry. There's a lot of change, uh, a lot of very exciting uh, opportunities and challenges. Um, when you think about these new standards, how do you view um, helping institutions become more relevant, more effective, more competitive, if you will, uh, in this environment? 
Well, if we take the three great priorities of the Greek trade uh, uh, ideas that are uh, leading these uh, new standards, which are innovation, engagement, and impact, let's just take uh, the example of engagement. Uh, via this uh, new orientation of the standard, school will be closer to the reality of the market, closer to their stakeholder at large, and therefore this uh, new proximity with, let's say, the real world will change a lot of things. If we take all the Europe, there are many countries where the schools are still very uh, doing a very good job, but uh, which is uh, in a sense, separate from what's going on in the economic world or what's going on in corporate relation. Now, with this new direction in the standards, this will be no more a plus, it will be a minus, and so schools will then probably benefit from this priority on engagement by having a better knowledge of the environment. Under this category of uh, enhancing competitiveness, making schools more relevant, helping guide them in that direction, uh, um, thoughts on that, please? I think, uh, you know, again, it's, it's a mistake to enforce how a school will choose to be relevant, and I don't think the standards do that at all. Rather, they ask the question, how are you engaging, which is a, um, and different schools will choose to engage differently, and that's entirely fine. And for me, the perspective is more from the consumer or the student's perspective. And from the prospective student's perspective, they now have a choice of, hopefully because of the new standards, they will have a broader choice. And given how diverse a prospective MBA student body is, I think it's good uh, overall, the, the impact it will have on management education is to provide greater choice for students, which is a very, very good thing. Other comments? The other thing that I would add, uh, and a significant part of the process, uh, as Jan mentioned earlier, is the, the peer review teams that visit. And really, one of the primary roles of those peer review team visits is a consultative aspect of what they do. They're not just looking to see has the school sort of met the standards, but they're also looking at how can we help the school get better at what it says that it wants to do. <clears throat> and so there's a really important consultative and interactive piece <clears throat> to that process that I think over the long run, uh, even more than it has in the past under the existence of these new standards, will really help schools be thoughtful about how they're improving, how they're continuing to do what they want to do more effectively, and that consultative piece where you bring in a variety of deans to, to meet with you and talk about what you're doing, I think is going to be extremely valuable to schools as we go forward. And I think the, from an economic standpoint, probably the most uh, difficult uh, issue that uh, colleges are going to face going forward is is the cost of delivery of education and one of the things that in these new standards with with the ability to be more flexible I think we're going to see a lot more experimentation with how to deliver education in a more cost-effective fashion while still delivering high quality so I, I think from that standpoint we we could basically have a, a great deal of influence on on the cost of education and, and the competitiveness of schools that are having difficulty with their co controlling their costs within the institution we have another reporter question. Um, how do the new standards support institutions outside the United States uh, specifically, uh, given that it is a global membership and there's a very diverse group of schools from around the world who are members, and that's where a lot of the growth is, of course, in, in the management education marketplace. Um, any thoughts on this? Well, the characteristic of the rest of the world, I would say, is diversity. So you have very different models of business schools. You have a different... Uh, ways to uh, solve the economic uh, constraints. You have different ways to look at what are the disciplines, etc. So there are, there is a great diversity. Therefore, the capacity for the new standards to embrace this diversity by uh, giving each school uh, a better uh, opportunity to make their case, in a sense, to show what they really do and how they align both the action with the mission that they have this will be a great support for the uh, schools in the rest of the world uh, from uh, Latin America, Asia, and of course uh, Europe, where uh, there are also a uh, lot of different uh, schools that are expecting, waiting on this new standard to apply for accreditation. 
Thank you, Terry. I want to touch on that a little bit. <coughs> uh, uh, we are learning each year uh, about um, education uh, throughout the world, business education throughout the world, and we're taking those best practices back to uh, the schools uh, in the United States but, and, and for all of the membership. And, and I think a good example is, is we're, we're going to have a major um, uh, thought piece coming out uh, in the next several months on doctoral education um, because we need to find a way to provide uh, access to doctoral programs and still maintain quality. And we've learned so much from other models of doctoral education throughout the world. In the United States, we've been somewhat rigid in, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the way we've structured doctoral programs. But by seeing how doctoral programs are, are organized, uh, structured, and how they maintain quality in, in Asia, in Europe, uh, we're now taking those models back to the United States and trying to incorporate those here. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity to learn from different models all throughout the world. It's, been, uh, it, it's making us uh, better. Uh, Dean Kumar is an institution who has campuses in uh, several different continents and such. You're obviously uh, deeply involved in the global delivery of management education. Do, what do these standards say to you in terms of helping to guide some of the work or decisions that you might make in that context? Um, maybe I should provide a little bit of background for us. Um, as uh, Linda pointed out, uh, for us, the consultative aspect of the visiting committee is the most useful thing. That is peer feedback on what we are doing and uh, providing a uh, relatively objective third-party assessment of what we are doing is extremely valuable to us, and it helps us decide strategy uh, and so on. Um, and so the five-year reviews provide a input into our own internal quality assurance and improvement processes. For example, uh, we do curriculum reviews and uh, revisions on a fixed schedule, uh, but the reviews are uh, in, um, informed by the AACSB visiting committee's report on us. Mm -hmm. right? so, so it's actually, to Linda's point, uh, for us it's less the objective uh, evaluation criteria that matter as much, and what matters more is the subjective evaluation criteria, which helps us, uh, you know, which informs our strategy. Mm -hmm. Other comments on this point? We have another reporter question. Uh, um, do the new standards unlock accreditation possibilities for new schools that previously could not have met the standards? Definitively, if we take uh, uh, the, the new standard on uh, faculty qualification and even uh, broader on the definition of uh, what faculty uh, uh, is or should be, uh, this opens uh, a lot of uh, possibility for schools that have a diverse uh, system compared to uh, the good old uh, system that was existing for the last uh, 20 or 50 years or so. And uh, definitely, if we take simply that example, and if we it, it shows that uh, there will be a great opportunity for uh, schools that didn't uh, meet the good old model as long as there was a model at the SCSB. And we add now the standard two on uh, intellectual contribution. This also opens a lot of uh, possibility and capabilities for schools that uh, do practice uh, relevant and rigorous uh, intellectual contribution, but uh, through another way that only doing classical research and publication. And I think I would add kind of back to one of your first questions about, you know, does it make it easier to get accredited? Uh, again, that it's not making it easier, but I think it's making it for a broader set of high quality schools that might have different models than the traditional models that we've historically thought about in terms of how you deliver business education. And so the, the faculty model kind of broadens that perspective while still trying to ensure <clears throat> high quality in terms of the research that's being done and the delivery of the educational experience, but recognizing that there's a broader set of models for how you do that than maybe we've historically thought about, particularly as you move into a global marketplace. Ray, any other comments? I would agree with that. It, it 
if we're talking, uh, I think we're probably talking about faculty qualifications as a, as a mainly an inhibitor, and I think the standards do recognize that uh, the whole sufficiency and qualification issue can be addressed by an, in a number of different ways by, by institutions. Uh, and the traditional view of scholarship that we had under the old standards, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, maybe is not the only way that's, that faculty can show that they are maintaining, uh, you know, currency in their field and, and providing high-quality education to their students. So, <clears throat> last Friday, I was on, an, on a campus at a university that is not AACSB accredited, and I got this exact question from them. Does this, does this sort of open up the accreditation door for us? And it was interesting. The reason that, 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 they are, that this school is not AECSB accredited is really not that the school uh, was concerned about meeting the standards. It's that they have a very heavy emphasis on engagement that they felt like was not all that compatible with AECSB accreditation. Uh, I think it does open up the door for schools like this, and, and I think we will see some uh, renewed interest in AACSB accreditation because of these standards. Here's another uh, reporter question. Uh, do the new standards make it easier for schools to hire more practitioners without PhDs? I don't, I don't think it makes it easier. Uh, I think that was already there. Yeah, right. Except I think it does, uh, kind of formalize that in, in, the, in the, the categories of faculty in, in the new standards. Uh, but uh, I, I think that flexibility has, has been there before, but it's, it's, it's certainly more obvious now, uh, I think, than it was under the prior standards. Yeah, and I think there's another way to answer that, that question. The standards, have, especially the standards since 2001 or 2002 when we passed them the last time, have always allowed to uh, uh, schools to hire practitioners. Uh, what I think needs to change there are the, the school's attitude towards hiring people who are practitioners, uh, as opposed to the traditional tenure track model. There are still some schools that will only allow the traditional tenure track model faculty members to be hired. I think that's a mistake. Um, there, there, there is plenty of room within the standards to have what some schools will call clinical faculty. And, uh, and I think it's a mistake not to have clinical faculty. There are, there are, there are areas with special expertise uh, where these clinical faculty members can bring expertise to the classroom where students can apply these, these practices tomorrow and where our faculty may not be trained. And if a school doesn't take advantage of that, that's, that's crazy to me. The other thing that the <clears throat> new qualification standards do is recognize a broader set of types of faculty can add tremendous value to right. the learning experience for students. So now we have the opportunity, if you're a practice-oriented faculty member, that if you're doing scholarly work, that actually matters and counts, and we really have it sort of incentivized that in the context of the standards. Or you may have faculty who have PhDs who've traditionally done a lot of scholarly work that want to transition to doing more applied work, working more with businesses, boards, other things, and it actually recognizes that and gives value to that because there's great value in that in the learning experience, particularly for certain types of schools. So I think it's broadened <clears throat> the types of faculty uh, that actually enrich the learning experience for a lot of different types of students. I've been assured this time that we really do just have a few minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> that last one was a test. Uh, could we close on the, the idea of uh, implementing the new standards? A reporter question also is what's the biggest challenge and I'll add the biggest opportunity uh, to uh, implementing these new standards now. We have about three minutes so everybody can take a well, short breath at it. I, you know I, I don't from many of the schools that are already accredited, I think implementation is going to be fairly easy. Uh, the, I would say, probably, I would point to one thing that I think probably is the, is the, the most uh, difficult thing that accredited schools will be facing, and that's the whole idea of measuring, measuring the impact and, and doing much more in terms of performance measurement uh, of, their, of the quality of their programs in terms of external measures. I, there's more of an emphasis on indirect measures of quality in these standards, which I think will uh, cause people to look at how, ca how can we really determine that we have a high quality program, which I think will make a difference. I think another significant implementation issue is having peer review teams ready to review teams as quickly, as schools, as quickly as those schools want to move to the new standards. That's going to be a real challenge for us. 
But I also think there's tremendous opportunity in the transition. And as we prepare peer review teams, uh, it's really important that we shift everybody's mindset and that people don't sort of continue to apply the old standards. So the training will be critically important for teams and for schools. But I think in that there's tremendous opportunity because through that training, we can really begin to embed some of the overarching principles that we believe are really important going forward. And this transition allows us to do that in a much more significant way than if we hadn't changed the standards. They didn't have to go through the new implementation. Very good. And I think we also have to, uh, I think one of the other challenges is going to be educating the, the member schools as to what the new standards uh, really mean. Uh, because there's a lot of misconceptions when, uh, you know, amongst the, amongst the members uh, when you read the standards the first time. And there will be a number of, uh, of seminars and opportunities for schools to take part in that. So, you know, any comments? Uh, uh, rather than talk about implementation in the short term, maybe I'll end with uh, implementation in the long run. So over the next decade, I suspect that the AACSB will go back to the table and, uh, or at least I hope that they will go back to the table and look at it again, uh, just because it's the right thing to do. You know, not that I see any deficiencies in the standard per se, but it's just the right thing to do. And as the business world, and therefore the business education world changes, it's incumbent on the AACSB to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's a tradition of AACSB. It's not the first time that the uh, standards are moving. It's uh, probably uh, in the history of uh, the institution. It's uh, probably the fourth time. So there is a, a culture to uh, implement, to move, to change, and to okay. then train people uh, to exist. It's not the first time the institution is uh, experimenting that situation. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of AACSB, I would like to thank all of you, our distinguished panel, for taking time to share your thoughts and thank all the reporters who uh, kindly joined us as well and thank you uh, for your time. We look forward to more conversation around this uh, important and exciting development uh, as it unfolds. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.